Welcome to Breaking Banks. Welcome to Breaking Banks. I am Brett King, the host of the show. I guess you guys know me after all this time. Um, we are the number one global fintech radio show and podcast. Joining me in the co-host hot seat tonight is, or today, rather, I've got to be careful saying that. I'm, I'm actually in Thailand doing the show at the moment. Everyone else is uh, in, uh, in, in a much more respectable time zone. Um, but uh, yeah, joining me as co-host today is Dr. Lita Gliffitz. Lita is the Chief Client Officer for 10X Future Technologies and a leading voice in the financial services industry and a friend of the show. Welcome back, Lita. Always good to be here. Thank you for having me. Where are you today? I'm in London and it's sunny and misleading and glorious misleading <laughs> it's misleading i've had a bunch of calls with uh australians your, your your fellow aussies early this morning and they're all like where are you i'm in i'm in london on a rare sunny day it is misleading um but uh i, I think um having said that london is very pretty when when the sun comes out you know, especially down at hyde park or something like that right that it is and uh, also joining us is Vincent uh, Besma. He's the head of uh, strategy in North America with Backbase, where he leads strategy execution and corresponding sales initiatives, focusing on building exceptional teams, operational excellence, and industry alliance and partnerships. Vincent, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Thanks for having me. And joining us from Jumio is Ryan Halstead, Vice President Sales for North America. And uh, Jumio is on a mission, and he is on a mission, um, to help companies prosper by reducing cost and complexity, increasing visibility, and improving operations. So, Ryan, welcome to the show. Yes, thank you so much, Brad. Very excited to be here. You've been on the show before, haven't you, Ryan? I know Jumio's done a few shows. but Jumio has before, yes. I have not. You this have not. Favorite. Okay. All right. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you so um, much. Before we get into um, some of the the operational stuff, looking at digital acquisition and uh, you know the the secret source behind some of the challenges, it would be remiss of me not to um, talk about the fact that uh, a couple of weeks ago you guys announced a very nice uh, raise, a hundred and fifty million dollar raise led by Great Hill Partners, a PE firm. Um, that's fantastic news. Yeah, most definitely is. You know, this infusion represents one of the, the largest funding rounds in the digital, uh, the digital identity space. And it speaks to kind of the global importance of digital identity and where we're going into the future. So in regards to Jumio, we couldn't be any more thrilled about this. Uh, the money is going to go to continuing to bolster our automated product, as well as uh, just kind of build out some of the needed resources that we have as a startup. So we couldn't be any more excited about where we're going with this and uh, what it means to our organization moving into the future. So you, you, I mean, is this going to be opening new offices? Um, is it going to be uh, mainly hiring? Yeah, I think it's going to be more focused on the product. Um, and I think it's going to be more focused on hiring and getting some of the things right. Up until this point in time, Jumio has done a very good job of being cash flow positive and really kind of operating on a budget outside of some traditional startups. Um, we've used our own money to grow. So this 150 is really going to go in to bolster some of the things that we needed in the back end from an infrastructure perspective, really to help us out on the automation and to add some more support people on the internal side to help uh, continue grow uh, that customer satisfaction score and rating. Now, are you guys, um, you know, starting to get people coming back in the office or are you still mostly working from home? Yeah, most of us are still working from home at this point in time. Uh, the Palo Alto office has uh, probably three or four people in it during the week. Uh, the London office has three or four people, it, people in it during the week as well. And our Singapore office is about the same. We tend to rotate in and out, but uh, at this point in time, a majority of Jumio is still working remotely. Fair enough. And um, Lita, what are you are you finding? Are people starting to get back into offices in London? Um, 
slowly but surely, so we have a, a, a military grade operation that disinfects the office after everyone has been in a, an incredible system of, of, of signs that mark the desks that have been touched and then ghostbusters who come in and disinfect everything. And with appropriate uh, distancing and all the rest of it, the office has been open since the schools reopened in the UK. And I'm finding that people are really craving the normality of going back. But of course, we're discouraging people from having in-person meetings, definitely of more than a couple of people. And that's the thing that most of us, myself included, crave the most. The right. fact that you want to collaborate. We have calls with our colleagues in Australia who are sitting next to each other like normal people <laughs> who are sitting across the room from the client and they're turning the camera around. You're like, oh, I'm so jealous of you being in an office. I never thought I'd say that, but it's true. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Vincent? Um, I know you're in a satellite office. You're in the US office, not in the uh, Amsterdam um, head office, but what's it like at Backbase right now? Well, it's a little bit the same for us. We uh, all crave the social part. I think we can't wait until we can hit the road again and meet people and build trust and relationships that way. But our systems have always been in the cloud. Um, so, you know, us moving to home offices was very frictionless, if you will. Um, and I think we all did really well. But a year in, I think people need each other and people need to feed off of each other. And I think that that's where the amazing, you know, um, uh, innovation happens and, and, and collaboration happens. And I think you cannot sustain a business without going without that for too long. So I think we're all ready to go uh, to go back. But we have offices all over the world and, uh, and we do kind of the same thing. Just a few people in there at once um, and make sure that we are adhering to all the local guidelines and policies. Of course. It feels like it's starting to build momentum towards coming back, though. So that's uh, that's good. Well, let's dive. Uh, let's dive right in. Let's talk, uh, first of all, about um, digital acquisition. It, this is obviously something that during the um, pandemic has um, n not become so much of a differentiator in, in, in that um, it's been necessary um, you know, for, for banks to adopt. Um, one of the things we've seen in the US, and Lita, I'd love your comments on this in, in terms of um, Europe, but in the US um, uh, during 2020, we saw a distinct shift from the community banks and the credit unions uh, that didn't have digital acquisition. And we actually saw market share shift to either the larger banks or um, you know, the, uh, the challenges who've done very well during the pandemic in terms of growth because they were able to onboard new customers um, digitally. And so th there's a, you know, there's very clear um, you know, market stats now sort of showing that sort of digitization effect. Um, Lita, what are you observing in um, the UK and Europe more broadly? It, exactly what you're describing. And we've seen it happen in three waves. Um, the first thing is that the, the challengers, the digitally native companies gave a much better colleague experience as people started working from home. They had better tools. They were set up much better uh, with, with native tools for remote working. And the second was that, that acquisition piece that played in two parts. <clears throat> One was the traditional banks being willing but not able to provide uh, respite in, in certain things. And my my most, um, my most my go-to example across all of Europe was the payment holidays for mortgages. That was a government initiative across the board. And what I found in conversations with fellow clients and um, ex-banker colleagues saying, all of our systems are in COBOL. We have issued the decision, but we need uh, uh, an eight to 12 week coding period to get to where we need to. Um, on the flip side, of course, the digital natives in their majority didn't have the, the complex offering, didn't have the mortgages, didn't have the lending solutions, but they had a much more seamless, um, seamless experience. And what we're hearing is companies like Starling um, showing year on year profitability for the first time across, um, across this space. And speaking to high street banks here in the UK offline, they're seeing a 10% attrition where it counts the most current account switching of where the salary is paid 10 percent month on month has to be variable there is no way that that is sustainable but it's a very telling number and a scary one if you're an incumbent 
You know, and, and some of the banks, some of the incumbent banks are still, I, I think, struggling with uh, the whole, you know, ease of uh, account opening digitally. Um, I'm just on the hsbc.co.uk page. I, I, I feel um, I feel I've got a license to criticize HSBC a little because I worked on their digital strategy for 10 years. But, you know, when you go to sign up for an account there, you know, you, you have to go through four pages of T's and C's even before you start to get to the uh, actual uh, sign-on process, whereas, um, you know, we've got this plethora of apps now where you just download the app and and do so in the app a, a, a lot simpler. So, um, you know, Vincent, in, in terms of um, Backbase's stack, obviously, um, you know, you guys are, um, you know, building this core digital first banking um, platform capability. You're working with a ton of different organizations, including um, sort of helping incumbents uh, power things like digital acquisition. Um, but, um, you know, where do you, where do you see the demand for this coming from? Is this just now a natural extension in terms of uh, customers or, um, you know, in terms of their demand and, and, you know, um, or, or is this uh, being driven from within? Yeah, I, th I think there are multiple reasons depending on the size of your institution and probably also your digital maturity, right? We see, you know, think about a bell curve distribution, right? We see the, uh, the innovators, they went through digital transformation once or twice before, and they basically found themselves in another, you know, a legacy kind of mess, right? And they are now finding out like, okay, what are the parts of this stack that we should own, uh, that we should create ourselves? What are the parts of the stack, uh, especially around non-functional security compliance that we can uh, basically insource, uh, well, not insource, but basically uh, buy in the market and, and put uh, inside of our stack. So that's a completely different premise than, for instance, a community bank that is lagging on the digital capabilities. And um, um, we serve all kinds of customers, our smallest customers, 800 million assets on the management and our biggest counts in trillions. Um, so, so we have a unique perspective on how can you create a platform first notion um, that uh, where for all the major points, like who owns the customer, who owns the ledger, who owns the experience, who owns the security, that you can really assemble this kind of, um, you know, best in breed uh, architecture, these, these partners, for instance, and that's why we're so excited to partner with Jumio because their digital identity solution is, a, is something that is amazing that we can just simply embrace and we can bring to market really live on our digital engagement banking platform. Ryan, um, that's a, a great uh, sales pitch on behalf of uh, Jumio. But, um, you know, for you guys, uh, w when you go to a potential bank or a potential client, um, wh what's the primary business case you put forward in terms of, um, you know, Jumio's capability, particularly, you know, digital onboarding? Yeah, I don't know if it's a uh, if it's an exact functionality that we put forth. It's more just having a conversation about where things are going into the future. Um, if you look back at you know 2006, some of the largest companies that existed were Exxon, GE, Microsoft, and Citi. If you look ahead today, um, in 2016, it was Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. Right. These are the real challengers in my eyes. So they're able to keep up very, very quickly with the technology. They have the technology to onboard the folks. They have the ability to kind of get in there and do this on a very, very quick manner. So when I look at where, where this industry is going, the larger banks in the United States and around the globe are going to have to adapt to this new world. They're going to start seeing uh, competitors coming from multiple different spaces, not just the neo banks, but also the large technical providers. Um, if you look at Apple Pay, if you look at some of these other other um, companies, I know that Home Depot just came out with uh, um, Home Depot loans, I believe it was. So everyone is really starting to enter this space, and it's going to become very, very important that the traditional banks um, try to differentiate themselves more in a way that some of these neo banks or these challenger banks are doing that. And that's where, like I said, uh, where, what Vincent said, this is where Backbase and Jumio really collaborate very well together. So we're helping some of those challengers, we're helping some of those smaller mid-tier banks come up and start to play in some of the larger spaces. 
Um, I'll open this question up to all of you guys um, and just give me your thoughts. For, for a customer looking for a new bank account during the pandemic or finding frustration with the, um, you know, the, the slow digitization of their bank and finding that they just couldn't do some things because they were restricted to having to go to the branch to do something and the branch wasn't open, for example. Um, you know, with, with, with challenges, uh, you know, in, in Europe and, and so forth uh, growing, do you think that, that um, you know, the sort of first glimpse of the organisation through the onboarding process is actually something that drives them to completion, um, you know, that that simplicity piece of it is, is sort of like, oh, well, that was easy. You know, is that is that a big part of, you know, now sort of the defining digital experience? Yeah, absolutely. If, if I can, guys, um, yeah, absolutely spot on. I, I, I do think we approach it from a different, a slightly different angle when uh, we have an amazing business consultancy team within Backbase, for instance, and they have a whole bunch of reports on our website, uh, particularly about this problem. But we see it's like for any task that you are about to embark on, there is a certain amount of energy you want to spend on it. And the moment that that energy limit is, uh, is, is broken, you're checking out. And it doesn't matter how far you are in the process. You're just like, ah, oh, man, this is this is too much. It's just and too you hard. just drop yeah. everything, right? So what Absolutely. what you have to do is obviously you have to take somebody on this kind of proverbial journey, um, where uh, the customer in each step sees, or the potential customer in each step sees what the value is they're going to get out of it, right? So whether that is conversational style onboarding, or whether it is you know highly technical, or maybe in phases uh, over over time. Um, it, 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 there's been some really interesting research on it. And, and we can see that one, it's the time spent, effort spent. Second, it's also what is my ability to customize? Like is the bank or the credit union pushing me into their model or am I myself? Can I uh, customize my product? Uh, can I um, you know, forego certain elements for to obtain a better rate? Or can I um, uh, choose to use technology? Uh, that removes the friction out of a, tickle, a typical onboarding process. And the, 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 the third part, and this is probably the scariest part, uh, a lot of institutions have a lot of reasons to say no and not do it, right? Not right. being customer focused and not removing the friction out there. And it's kind of hard, you know, I, I, I obviously uh, virtually I'm in a lot of boardroom sessions and you literally hear people saying, we have never had these many customers. We have never had this high of deposits. Why should we do digital? You know, that is still a voice that you hear and, and you have to slash that. You have to think in a different operating or execution model uh, to really start understanding that I uh, had the question you posed, Brad, that it's, it's about friction. It's about uh, giving instantaneous value and it's about mass customization, if you, uh, if you will. And if you don't do that, uh, to the previous point, uh, some of these, uh, these larger tech companies are going to eat your lunch. I'm nodding vigorously as you speak, Vincent, and I, I, I don't know whether you have a great skincare regime or you're, you're very young, but if you are very young, you will not recognize what I'm about to say, but I think Brett and I will, 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 will have the scars to prove it is true. Before we started talking about digital transformation and we were just talking about transformation and modernization, the one thing that you'd be told every time you did a a planning session or a strategy session is leave the hairy beast alone. And the hairy beast was always onboarding. And it was agreed that it was the hairy beast you wouldn't take on and you wouldn't take it on because it was too complex. But you would also not take it on because you knew that everybody was pretty much as bad as each other. And provided yeah. all the incumbents left the hairy beast alone, then yeah. you could cherry pick their sort of low hanging fruit. And then as the, the challengers came in and showed us what is possible with user journeys, especially when they got the, the, the sort of FCA stamp of approval in the UK and, the, and the, the regulatory blessing in the rest of Europe. The art of the possible moved goalposts, but you still had that slight reservation on behalf of the consumer that allowed the incumbents to push the complexity of onboarding out. Um, the reality is not only do we know that it's possible, not only does the regulator know it's both possible and actually best practice, but we have, I think, as an industry underestimate the rapidly growing digital literacy of our consumers. Because it used to be that 
the people with the money don't really do digital and the younger generations are coming through the ranks slowly. Well, A, no, they don't. Millennials are in their 40s. And B, my dad, who's in his late 70s, does all his banking online. And I think having underestimated that digital literacy growth, we're seeing a lot of incumbents that even if they've turned the ship around in terms of convincing themselves that they can't avoid the hairy beast anymore, the amount of heavy lifting they will have to do to untangle, forget the technology, their operating model, their pricing structure, the over leveraging of one part of the business to fund another. There are all these existential questions that have to be answered before they even say, I'll pick up the tech. Um, that, that becomes a, a, very, a very interesting discussion because it used to be, do we choose to take it on? And now the question is, this is hygiene. This is an absolutely right. essential. Because as you say, people will walk away from this onboarding experience and they have 10 better ones to choose from. I, I, I Brian, you want to jump in? Yeah, you know, to, to Lydia's point, you know, 71% of millennials would rather go to the dentist than they would to a bank branch. We'll just kind of leave it there. I mean, it becomes so, so obnoxious to kind of go in and keep doing this. But I was the at the dentist yesterday, by the way. Yeah. And I can confirm that that's still true. Yeah. The younger generations, you know, they grow, they've grown up in an always on instantaneous, uh, you know, environment and they, they, they expect this, you know, you don't see... For somebody to go in and open up a Facebook account and have to go into a branch to open a Facebook account or go in and wait two weeks to open up an Instagram account, that does not work for them. They're going to expect the same thing when it comes to their banking or their finances as things move forward. So the always on, the instantaneous, the ability to do everything from the mobile device is going to become more and more important as the younger generations come up and the older generations continue to adapt and, and learn on technology. But the, yeah, the, maybe sorry, go ahead, Benson. Well, I, I really feel triggered to 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 share two things that I've uh, that I've picked up in along the way uh, of my almost twenty five years of customer experience now. Uh, so, Lena, it's 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 probably my skincare routine, I guess. But um, you could no, give me we, some pointers <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> we will. But you you mentioned uh, digital literacy, and I think that 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 is actually blanketing an underlying trend. And and I think the underlying trend here is uh, uh, the one of self directiveness, right? Like. I don't want to engage with you on your terms. I want to engage at my uh, on my own terms. And whether I want to go into the branch for something simple or whether I want to do uh, a mortgage application online, I want to be in control. And I don't want the bank to dictate because every bank is thinking in the terms of like long neck, long tail type of stuff, right? Like what can we move to digital? And what is the long tail that we should not put in digital because it's right. too costly? We need to abandon that type of thinking. And we need to say our customer, they make the decisions, which channel, what time, how, for whatever purpose they want to engage with us and we better be ready. And I think that that is the, the major difference uh, that you're now seeing actually amplified by some of the neobanks. Uh, they can play the niche, right? So they can be hyper-focused on one thing and do it so well that both the long neck and the long tick is, uh, tail is completely digitized. But now do that for a full service bank, it's, 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 it's impossible, right? So channel fluidity, being able to move and choose your channels uh, is, uh, is, is, is absolutely paramount. And, and then you guys raised an amazing point is, well, okay, it's complex, yes. And my regulator has something to say about it, yes. And this is where half of the bank stop thinking, right? Because it's too complex. I don't want to rock the boat. This is my forever job. I don't want to get fired, you know, that type of stuff. And as long as you have those types of thinkers in your organization, you're not going to uh, create this fist uh, to fend off the, the neobanks and or the tech players. So, um, you know, I, I, I used to joke that um, the onboarding process at, traditional banks, particularly in the early days of the internet, was was lucky to be a customer scenario, right? Which yeah. was the banks would say, here's all the hoops you have to jump through before we'll let you be our customer. And that's what really changed with challenges, right? Because the challenges sort of said, um, no, 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 we want to make it as easy as possible for you to get a bank account. And that turned out to be a key element in them building market share because they're able to acquire customers at scale digitally. Uh, 
which you can never do if you've got the mindset of you're lucky if uh, we let you be our customer, um, you know, offsetting risk and all of those other things, which was the view of, of the industry, uh, certainly as, as the internet arrived. Would you guys agree? 100%. Yeah. 100%. So- and the, the expectation that you're lucky to be our customer. You're absolutely right. And also, that if, even if you cornered them, they knew that the bank across the street was no better, or at least no better. Right, different. right. And so that's what challenges really changed. They changed customer expectations. And, well, and yeah, go ahead. Sorry, but... sorry Brad. Uh, I don't want to make it a habit of interrupting you, but it, it... It's, 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 it's actually much larger than just the neobanks, right? Uh, because I completely agree with you. If you have a new proposition with either, you know, a, 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 a great interest rate on a savings account or something like that, and you want to attract customers, well, if it's still a lot of friction, then, then you're not going to grow as a neobank. So it was that lifeline. Right. But it's really that kind of platform thinking that I feel has shifted our, the, the expectations of customers so much, right? Uh, Uber for mobility, Netflix for content, uh, um, you know, Facebook for anything social nowadays. It, it, it's, it's that platform that they have created that allows these institutions to run at incredibly low uh, uh, cost efficiency ratios um, that gives them a lot of marketing tools, for instance, and a lot of funding for these digital uh, first experiences. Uh, and I think that that is, at the end of the day, the real competitor. And, and I think neobanks have just been really smart in, in, in jumping onto that different expectation set for experiences and, and monetizing that uh, where, where you know, other banks were just looking at their, their mainframes and their COBOL programmers and saw like, yeah, we, we can't compete. Uh, it requires change, right? And, and change is difficult, right? And it, it requires, uh, in many of your shows, Brad, you have been talking about you know, the antiquated business models that a lot of banks are still under. Well, I would also challenge you in extent of that, it's the operating model that these banks have grown accustomed to. And that's what you need to slash. That's where you need to find the real change agents um, to, to fend off this threat. But I think yeah. you're, if I can add, uh, at, at, at the danger of running down the clock, I totally agree with you. But I would say that the, the neobanks have been good at this in a nonlinear fashion. And if anything is a big takeaway and lesson for the incumbents, that should be it. Particularly in the UK, where I, I'm more intimately uh, connected to what they've done, none of our challengers have had linear paths of success. They've all launched products that didn't work out and they had to go back to the drawing board. They had support models that didn't scale very well and they had to go back to the drawing board. Every single one of the, the, the neobanks that we have in the UK have had egg on their face at some point and they had to go back and redo. And that ability to say, you know what, that didn't work, so I'm going to do it differently in a way that is in tune with your customers, in tune with the need that your money will run out at some point, and dynamic is the better learning. It's not just, hey, look, the Neos are better than you incumbent. It's a, they didn't get it right, but they kept trying, and that's your lesson. Can you learn it? And, and they had the ability to switch or pivot. Um, and make those uh, tactical changes. Hey, guys, let's just take a quick break. Ryan, after the break, I'd like to talk about, uh, you know, the demands that have come on you guys uh, during COVID as a result of this shift towards digitization. And uh, maybe we can talk about uh, buy now, pay later and some of these sort of micro experiences that are emerging as well. I think that'd be really interesting. You're listening to Breaking Banks. We'll be right back. You're back with us on Breaking Banks. We have on the show uh, Lita Glifferts, who's uh, the Chief Client Officer for 10X Future Technologies, uh, joining us uh, once again as a co-host. We have Vincent Besima, Head of Strategy North America with Backbase, and Ryan Halstead, VP of Sales North America for Jumio. Um, Ryan, let me um, just continue on the conversation we had just before the break, but specifically ask you, um, given the landscape we just talked about and the fact that suddenly you had this very clear differentiation presented by challenges and those that had invested in digitization during the pandemic, that they were able to switch to that digital um, you know, support mode for customers very easily. 
for those uh, banks that hadn't invested in that, that assumed they had more time, um, you know, what was it like in the early days of the pandemic when you could see that penny drop, when you could see that realisation? How were these uh, banks talking to you about, um, you know, digital onboarding? Yeah, so of course, as we all know, COVID changed just about everything. Most of the, the larger banks struggled to keep up in, in regards to onboarding. It was a huge problem area for them uh, when it kind of came down to it. Um, you know, when you look at what the millennials expected during that time or what the younger uh, generations or what all generations expected was they wanted 100% onboarding, onboarding remotely. They wanted to be able to onboard remotely. So what I saw a lot of the big banks coming to me in the United States, um, I think it's important to go back when for the past four years, I spent a majority of my time overseas working with Revolut, Metro, Monzo, Loop, Tide, Curve, name it. When I came back over to the U.S., uh, one of the main things that the customer or what the larger banks wanted to know is what are they doing? Tell me what they're doing. How are they doing it? What are they doing? How are they moving this? How is this being secured? They had so many questions. Um, there was a point in time, and we had a line of a majority of the top, you know, Fortune 10 banks that were just standing there, and all they were really doing was kicking tires. How did you do this? How did you do this? Where did this go? What challenge did they run into here? Well, this is a lot of free consulting. <laughs> so we we ended up just talking to them about where what we were doing from a high level, how it was changing, how the how the younger generations were adapting to it. Um, and then we really started talking about clicks and friction. So when it came down to it, I did a lot of research behind the scenes. And when you look at neo banks or challenger banks, for that matter, there are seven less clicks to open up a bank account across the board than if you were to go do it um, with one of the larger banks, say JP Morgan Chase, you're going to click seven less clicks, but then you're also going to have to go into a bank. So there's a whole nother aspect of this to show your ID that is not going to scale. So what they wanted to know is, how are you doing it? How did they do it? What were their problems? And how can I bring it to the US and make it work here? That was a, one of the major things that we saw during the COVID outbreak. You know, I can, I can share with you guys the experience of launching Movin in, in 2012. We had the first mobile onboarding for a debit card in the world in an app. Um, and uh, it, it, it was... I, I I laugh because here we are nine years later and there's still people almost treating it with disbelief that it's possible from a technical perspective because they're so, to leader's point, they're so used to the fact that there's these obstacles in the way organizationally and technically um, that, yeah, and yet this is, uh, it, it's, it's not like it's rocket science, right? But um, all right. Hey, um, uh, let, I want to talk about buy now, pay later and some of the trends that are happening there. Um, I don't know whether you guys have seen, but Klarna, um, you know, had a very strong um, year in 2020, as did Affirm. Um, it, more than a million new US users have joined the Klarna platform every month since October. This is uh, news that came out in February, um, uh, just uh, just a month a month or two ago, um, and by the end of uh, 2020, they had three and a half million monthly active users, which was a 200 percent increase year on year. Um, Sixty thousand new users each day download the app, downloaded the app in December. That sort of coincides, obviously, with Christmas shopping and so forth. But the more interesting point of this is. Um, you know, the contextualization of credit, the, the, the way financial services, this is sort of the next phase of digitization. So maybe Vincent, I'd like you to sort of, um, you know, give, give your thoughts about this. You guys talk about Backbase as an omni-channel platform, but when we start talking about extending the distribution layer and embedding that in other experiences so that banking is just part of the fabric of your day-to-day -day life rather than you go to the bank and you get credit access. Instead, now you're in a purchase process. Oh, and credit is built into the purchase experience, such as buying a Peloton bike, um, you know, uh, with, with the firm. Um, you know, th that's, that's sort of the game changer, particularly as you start thinking about 
how um, the user experience might go with smart glasses. Cause you know, Apple's talking about launching smart glasses next year. You're not going to be in the middle of a purchase experience using gestures or voice with smart glasses, buying a product and then have to go to a bank website or download a bank app in your glasses to, to get access to credit. It's going to have to be contextual. And so um, this all requires a lowering of friction. I know I'm talking a lot here, but um, how do you guys see banks adapting to that, to that sort of distributed um, banking utility play? Well, in, in the US, we see banks struggling with that. Um, obviously, bank base has customers all across the world, and we definitely see areas in the world where banks just accept like, hey, the, the moment of truth, right? The purchase moment or the decision moment is for instance made in WeChat, uh, the, 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 the Asian uh, WhatsApp clone. Um, so we wanna be in there, right? And, uh, uh, but here in the US, we still see like, no, we, we shouldn't give up too much to social media because then we automatically compete with an Apple or with, uh, with a Facebook, or we should not, Give but it's like they don't have a choice. You're not driving the truck anymore, guys. You know um, exactly that. You see the same thing with with uh, with business banking, for instance, right? Like uh, businesses want banking as part of their bookkeeping ap uh, application. They don't want to go to your ban to the bank's website. They don't want to do accounts receivable, accounts payable there, or at least the, the larger majority doesn't want to. Absolutely. And what do banks do? Well, we are going to push you to our website still. Right. So it's, it's really fundamentally embracing the fact that, to your point, the distribution model allows us a whole bunch of social media, it allows us open banking, right? So obviously, uh, Europe is pioneering right now that we can literally take a page out of that playbook and see how can we create a fabric, how can we create a, uh, a, a, a distribution mix that allows us to be there at that moment of truth for our, for our customers. And uh, you see Amex trying to do it with pay later inside of their app. You see, uh, you know, a firm. Uh, for us, it's, it's really um, uh, in the boardrooms, we see two, two types of customers, right? The ones that say, oh, yeah, we are organized in such a way we can adopt it real quickly. And, and typically those are the larger organizations because they basically own their platform. And then on the complete other side of the spectrum, you see kill the banks that will say, we're cookie cuttered in. Yeah. Uh, we can't even consider it unless our uh, banking provider is putting it on the roadmap, right? And, and this exactly creates the world where Backbase wants to sit in the middle of you know, we want you to have this platform so you can go fast. We want you to have out of the box journeys so you can go fast. But we also at each point want to give you the tool sets that allow to say, hey, there's something interesting happening in the industry, whether that is open banking and you need to create an API layer or an API gateway that you want to expose, or you want to add these smaller innovations inside of your uh, experiences as well. Uh, will that answer everything completely? No, because I think you need to own the, the moment of truth, right? You need to be there. Um, but I think uh, you at least have a fighting chance when you have that flexibility. It's a very, a very interesting uh, way of putting it. And I was going to say Backbase is very well positioned for that. What I'm seeing um, and I find very exciting is that in that space you described, there are those banks that are coming to the table and going, I started my digitization journey hoping that it was more about on the glass experience, I'm now realizing there's a lot of heavy lifting. I heard platform economics and thought, ooh, more for me. I'm now realizing it's about a different configuration of how we do things. But there is an opportunity to really reimagine credit, reimagine lending. But you have to do it in a way that sees the ecosystem differently to the point you were making. And we're doing some very exciting work at the moment with Westpac out in Australia who are building a banking as a service capability, very different to you come and consume everything I have, which was how big banks started thinking about um, banking as a service, but they're in a partnership with Afterpay. And the next partner to come onto the platform is Society One. And, and you're seeing that reconfiguration of traditional relationships of power saying, the art of the possible and the art of the expectable from the customer has completely changed. So if I want to play, I have to play by the new rules and leveraging what I have scale, my banking license, the trust of my customers to start stitching those moments of truths as you describe them into a new type of footprint is essentially greenfield economics for the banks. And it's super exciting. 
and not enough of them are, are stepping into this space. So for me personally, it's very exciting to be working with one that does. But I think we will see more of that exactly because that choice that you described is very stark and the economics of hesitation have stopped working. It's almost like a bifurcation, right? Because, you know, like just think about the implications of buy now, pay later. It is we've now got these embedded credit experiences. And so, you know, it, now the race is on. Everyone's going to be trying to insert, um, you know, their, uh, their credit experience in major purchase experiences. Um, of course, there's not room for, you know, myriads of players here. There's, there's a natural first mover advantage. But um, at that point, you know, how do you even argue to go to apply for a credit card when you can just access credit as part of the purchase experience. It's, it, it's, it's a really stark um, sort of shift in customer experience. Ryan, um, you know, how, how, looking out sort of five, 10 years, what, what do you think this is, uh, how this is going to land out? Are, are we going to really have that, the gaffers, the fangs, the BATXs, um, you know, just being the gatekeepers of this because it's built into OSs and banks are sort of left, um, you know, picking the uh, the scraps from the table or, or what, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, I, I truly do believe if they don't innovate and, and start to change their models and start to work for the consumer a little bit more, uh, they're going to go to the wayside. Again, when, when I look at the companies that we are talking to right now out in the industry, you're 100% correct. You know, you have Facebook, you have Amazon, you have, you know, Google, you have Apple. They are all acting as these tech giants that number one, focus on the user experience and then number two, focus on, on the money. Uh, you know, that is a, a, a separate portion of it. So if you were to ask me, I can, I can easily see the, the volume of banks being scaled down. And I can easily see if you go to any website right now, I was just on Home Depot the other day, they have a Home Depot. Um, if you look at something else, uh, somebody just said it, uh, you go to, um, you want to go to Bo uh, Bose and you want to buy a set of headphones, a firm is there. You want to do something else, Klarna is there. So I, again, I can see going to these websites and buying an Apple phone, doing the exact same thing with Apple, doing the exact same thing with Samsung. This is just going to keep um, growing and expanding. And then these banks are going to have to change and modify the way that they do business or they're going to go to the wayside. They're mostly just going to be repositories. And, and I, that's the way I feel. And you asked me 10, 15 years down the road, not today, not tomorrow, but into the future, I do see that happening, yes. But let's stay with that specter you just raised there. Uh, because when we all started this journey, I'll put my hand up, I was a banker for most of my career. Disintermediation was the biggest fear, but we never thought that we might lose that relationship with the client as, as, as the, the value that it used to carry to be the primary bank. So I guess, what is our thinking on what, it, what happens to that relationship, but also like what's the digital its value? Equivalent? Yeah, yeah, what's the digital equivalent and are we even barking up the right tree? Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a great uh, premise. I, I sincerely believe that if your digital approach is not centered around how do I orchestrate or assemble value for my customer, if if you cannot, uh, and and most banks cannot even do that today, right? But if if you don't have that as a fundamental departing point, and if you have not slashed your silos, in and uh, you know, just imagine these banks like full service banks with all these different silos that all proclaim to own the customer by themselves, right? Retail, wealth, commercial, uh, uh, mortgages, you name it. They, they all want to own the customer, right? You need and to slash these silos. Yeah. No, exactly. They don't uh, because they don't know about the other moments of truth that are important for those customers uh, in their lives. So you need to start uh, slashing these silos, tilting them to horizontal layers where you say, you know, we have a system that owns the customer and, and a process and, and, and a distribution mix around it. Then we have a system that owns the data and, and takes care of the compliance uh, uh, around it. Um, if, if, if you cannot think in these layers, 
then one, you cannot bring down your cost efficiency ratio, and that's going to hurt you in being competitive against these larger players. So that's absolutely a crucial outcome that you uh, that you need to protect. Uh, and you also don't have the technology to assemble that value into something that is meaningful for a customer, right? I, I, I still meet, like it's 2021 for crying out loud, and I still meet banks that require me to log in four times if I want to see the entirety of my f- financial relationship with them, that's right? Crazy. So how can you then tell me that you are, owning the relationship or that you know me or that you're personal to to me you're 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 simply not right and you're only giving me more reasons to abandon you um so it's 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 going to be interesting how this is playing out but i i think you know banks have two choices you're either going to be a commodity and you're going to provide services that are kind of api exposed and and the ecosystem can do with uh, what you want or you're going to play the 10 20 percent niche of people that just simply don't want larger institutions to be there at that moment and want to have some self-directiveness uh, as well uh, for, for, for everything that digital is bringing to us, which I think we uh, all agree is amazing because it built our careers. But on the other side, there's also a pushback against it, right? Like uh, how many people ha- are abandoning Facebook on a monthly basis, right? Um, so you, you see these trends going back and forth. Yeah. And, uh, and I will say, you're either gonna be an API provider, commodity-based uh, banking service, or you're going to play the niche and you're truly going to be there for me. And that means that I can move fluidly over all the ch- different channels at the right point uh, for, for me, self-directiveness. Because I, I think there's a, sorry to, to jump in there. I think there's a very valuable analogy um, there. And, and while you've been talking, I've been chuckling to myself because the ex- what you're describing is, is definitely the experience we've all had as consumers with big banks, right? Not, not just on the inside. But you, you bring a different, a very interesting analogy there. Um, you know, people are moving away from Facebook. Nobody is giving each other fish for their digital aquarium and throwing sheep at each other, right? But our immersion into digital capabilities is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And our reliance and expectation that they will work, that we will not arrange a cab for our teenager because they'll get an Uber and they'll be safe, that we can go on a rambling walk because we will, we will have maps on our phone. I would say that we're no longer as superficial in our consumption of digital services, but our reliance is getting deeper. What does that look like for the banks? And to be honest, Brett, I'd love to hear your thought as well. Well, on, it, on what does that look you like? know, here's, here's the thing is, um, you know, you've raised that, Vincent raised the cost efficiency, When's the penny drop to the market? When the market says um, the way banks operate is inefficient. Um, and, um, you know, you, you've got to be able to acquire customers at scale and you've got to be integrated into their life in a different way. And the concept of going to a branch and signing a piece of paper to get access to a financial services product is just so far from economical in, in the world of digital that it's irrelevant. Um, that, that's what amazes me is why, is it, why isn't the stock market analysts you know, putting the pressure, um, you know, holding the feet to the fire of, of the bigger banks. Maybe it's just because there's not enough, um, you know, listed alternatives, right, at the moment. But um, undoubtedly, as the challenges IPO, then um, I think um, those core economics are changing. Hey, listen, guys, I, I'm mindful of the fact that we've only got a couple of minutes left. And Lita, we could go down the whole rabbit hole on on on, on that stuff as, as we do when we get together. Um, but Ryan, um, uh, let let me just ask you um, this in terms of you know what Jumia has just taken this big uh, um, a chunk of cash. Um, what do you guys hope to achieve over the next couple of years in in terms of making a dent in helping banks um, you know maintain their relevance? Yeah. I, I think that, um, you know, just educating them on how things are being done differently, educating them on, on where we see improvements in the marketplace, where we have, where we have made changes in the marketplace for the better. Um, even if you just look at interest rates or things of that nature that banks are throwing out, um, even the challenger banks are, are lower in that aspect because they don't have the overhead. They can offer more affordable rates across the board. Uh, the larger banks, they, they, again, they have a lot of overhead, so they have to build that in somewhere. The nice part about it is, is that, um, you know, I, I definitely see 
um, you know, Jumio continuing to educate, but also continuing to lead these banks into the future, continuing to show them how we've had success in other locations around the globe, and then also some of the advantages that the companies have taken, taken, taken advantage of, I guess, if you will. Uh, so I, we couldn't be more excited about the future for Jumio, where it's going. Digital identity is only growing, as you, as you know. Um, the ability to know who your customer is online is only growing. Uh, and there are also a lot of innovative companies coming out, just like Backbase is, who's doing a lot of, uh, a lot of innovation for the mid-tier uh, challenger banks, and Jumio is right there with them to help them support support those growth efforts. So um, with this influx of cash, I can see us continuing to grow, but also continuing to optimize the way that people interact and work with their financial partners across the globe. Awesome. Vincent, just quickly, um, you know, when, when you were coming in and affecting this sort of change and you're, um, you know, uh, deploying back base for a bank so they can get these capabilities, how long does that take typically? Well, it's getting faster and faster. Um, five years ago, Backbase was very much a toolkit, a platform, um, and that could uh, be implemented fast. It could also take multiple years. Right now, we see, for instance, in uh, on average, that retail banking is 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 done in less than six months. So it's it's it, it's accelerating, and you're creating a library of reusable components: your core connection, your compliance, your 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 caching, etc., that you can then apply to other lines of businesses as well. So you can move very fast. Uh, we helped uh, a, a large country in Latin America uh, to release their COVID stimulus uh, checks in, the, in in less than 45 days of, of building, and they didn't have a digital footprint at all, right? So so we're getting better and better with our combination a cool of platform. Oh, absolutely. And it's super rewarding for everybody involved. And, and what is really amazing is that once you do those projects successfully, you can help the bank transform. And transformation awesome. do doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in a year. But uh, you can start, or this is our advice, if you abstract the customer experience away from your downstream systems and, uh, and know that your vendor, like Backbase, also has a process engine so that you can't uh, just put like lipstick on the pick, but you can also uh, remove friction uh, out of the process, then you're building a foundation that at least whatever the future is throwing at you, you can at least be agile. You can at least be flexible and respond to uh, to all those uh, to to all the changes that are coming going to happen. And I, I do want to say, you know, disruption is is not a graduate process, right? It, it happens all of a sudden, Brett, to your point, when do the uh, uh, market analysts pick up on it, right? When is the first domino going to fall? Uh, because trust me, there are people that bought a cap medallion for $150,000 in New York, and they did not imagine Absolutely. that Uber was stealing their lunch a year, year later, right? Um, and and, and, and um, uh, the, the only the thing that we can say Sorry, there's, go ahead, Bert. No, 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 we're going to wrap up because we're running out of time, but there's a lot of pigs with lipstick out there. I can tell you that. So, hey, uh, Lita, um, how can uh, people stay in touch with uh, your uh, musings on the industry and your writings? At Lita Glyptis on Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, and my uh, Lita Rights column is out every Thursday. Fantastic. And uh, Ryan, um, where can we find out more about Jumio? Sure, you can just go to jumio.com or on Twitter as well, Facebook, uh, and also LinkedIn. Um, so we'd love to interact with anyone out there who would uh, love to learn more about digital identity. Awesome. And um, of course, Vincent, Backbase, Backbase. Same here. Uh, Backbase.com. It also features a lot of interesting research that we have been doing with our partners. Uh, so if you need justification for changing business models, uh, you can definitely find us. Uh, also, our LinkedIn presence is, uh, is, is quite, uh, quite a good resource. Awesome. We'll try and tweet some of that research out as well for, for the listeners. So thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for uh, supporting us as a sponsor, too, for, for Jumio. And um, you know, Vincent and Lita, thanks for joining us on the show once again. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks.